Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 63. As always, my name is Mark, and here with me today, a very special guest, the creator of the podcast I've been binge-watching, or binge-listening uh, to recently, all the way from Berlin, Ben Maddox. Thanks for being on the podcast. Hello. I mean, you didn't mention the name of the podcast, but, but that's fine. Oh, yeah. I, well, I mean, it will be mentioned. Yeah, five games for Good. Tuesday. The podcast I, I had previously been recommended the most times and then i finally got around to listening to podcasts again and now i've been going through all of them Um, wow which crazy people have been recommending you the show oh man who isaac shalev first recommended it the show to me and then i think gilhova mentioned it it's the funny thing is your show has been the one recommended to me exclusively by other people who create stuff in the board game world right which which I find very interesting. It's like the, it's like the connoisseurs show. Yeah, there's no money in that, unfortunately, but it's, it's nice to be thought of. <laughs> but yeah, we're going to be talking today a bit about. I want to talk to you about Five Games for Doomsday because I do find it a very fascinating podcast. But the main topic for today, we're going to be talking about the role of the reviewer in, I guess, generally, but more more specifically in board games because that's what we talk about. Uh, yeah. which is something I've I've mentioned. I've written about a bit, I mentioned briefly on this podcast, but haven't dedicated an entire episode to it. And I know uh, you had a little rant about it. Oh, I don't know how long. I, 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 would, ago. I would like to consider it a reasoned argument from a certain point of view. Well, I mean, okay, you don't know me. Rant is, is, is a good thing in my mind. I enjoy <laughs> ranting. So uh, was that a couple months ago? You, you, you yeah, something that little like that. podcast, and then I found it very interesting. And I think we'll we'll start from there and and go on. But first, let's talk about let's talk about you as a podcaster because Five Games for Doomsday isn't the first board game podcast you've done, right? No, I did a couple of projects. I did a couple of projects before, and you know, it's one of those things. You 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 blame other people for things going wrong, and then when things go wrong enough you realize that it's probably you, to be honest. And so, yeah, I did a couple of shows. Uh, one sort of fizzled out. The other one sort of ended quite acrimoniously and quite is underselling it somewhat. And, you know, I'm an actor by profession. And the beauty about podcasts is, you know, you can get them, you can put them out there, and you can sort of create your own work. And the only problem is you've got to kind of hope people are listening, and I hope sometimes people are. In terms of five games for Doomsday, what was was there was there like a moment of inspiration? It's like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna interview people, and it's gonna be this apocalyptic setting. Or how how did you come to that idea? I don't know. It, I guess it had been it, it basically my last podcast sort of imploded, and I started the new one sort of three weeks later. And I just I guess it had been sort of bubbling away in my brain because I was thinking about another project. I was doing research for another project, which I will do one day, which was set in a a nuclear bunker, one of these sort of prepper bunkers, you know. So I'd been watching a lot of YouTube videos, doing a lot of reading, sort of reading a lot of survivalist websites, which are absolutely hysterical. This was this was le- and especially so sort of, I, I found some good ones sort of leading up to the election between Trump and Clinton and a lot of people talking about how even if Clinton lost, she wasn't going to relinquish the White House and we'd have to rise up against the coup. All of that stuff is absolutely hilarious. America is a, a very funny country. And so I guess that whole apocalypse thing had been bubbling around in my brain for ages. And then I was just thinking of ideas, things I could do and sort of it was very important to me that I do something on my own, essentially. So then I can have complete control over it. And, you know, if I was going to argue with anybody, it was going to be me. And then I had this idea of, ah, oh, you know, top five lists are cool, but they're very generic and very easy. And I want something that's an interesting thing. And then I came up with this idea and then I realized, oh, my God, that's almost exactly the same as Desert Island Discs on BBC Radio 4. But I thought, you know, no one's going to listen, so I won't get sued. And that's kind of how the show started. <laughs> With the assumption that no one will listen. Right, know. exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how this one started, honestly. Although with, without nearly as much uh, thought put into it. It was very important to me that I produce something that 
was sort of very planned from the beginning. So I think I've probably got better at the whole interviewing thing over the sort of couple of years I've been doing it, but the structure of the show hasn't changed. And it's sort of, it's very meticulous. When I write out my show notes, almost everything I ask is is written before and it's sort of extensive uh, because the thing with sort of interviews, there are no rehearsals, right? And I'm an actor and I really like rehearsing. So you need to have, for me, something that's very planned, very structured, so I don't fail in the middle of the show. That's kind of important, you know? Yeah, that's interesting because, I mean, I've, I've started trying to do more preparation, in, in, especially in these kinds of podcasts where I'm, I'm you know, speaking with someone new who I haven't necessarily spoken to before. But my background is with with debate and impromptu speaking. So I right. always just want to be like, oh, we'll just wing it. We'll just go in and, and, and do what comes to mind. So f- just for those who haven't listened to Five Games for Dunes, I hi- again, I highly recommend it. You should be listening to it. Uh, the, the premise is that you have people on, uh, you interview them, but you ha- make them pick five games that they would want to hold on to in an apocalyptic scenario. Yes, Again, like so, you said, kind of a top five, but not really, because it, it pushes you to think about it in different ways. Well, I want the criteria to be different, you know. I think it's, I think it's, you know, what does what does a top five be? They're the five games I like the most, and and that's fine, I guess. But you end up talking about the game, and because I'm interviewing, sort of, it's primarily game designers, but it's also people involved in the industry, whether that be media, whether that be art, you know, sort of around board games. I want them to think of games more as artifacts rather than just, you know, things to rank. So I want them to think about the, the scenario, this scenario, and especially because I'm, I'm interviewing gamers and, you know, gamers have loads of games. This scenario really makes you focus in, I think, on what's important about gaming, not just I like this mechanism with this mechanism and the art's nice, right? And so it, I, I think it makes people more thoughtful about who they are. And the, the goal, although we talk about the games, of course, the goal is not really to talk about the games. The goal is really to talk about them and have those people, have a record of you know the people who produce the work that we love and what their views are on life, what their views are on the important things. I guess that's kind of the point. Right, yeah, and from a, a listener's perspective, I every every episode I listen to, I'm I'm constantly honing in what my five would be. And mm. It's like it's always those last one or two. <laughs> like I've got the I've got the like the first three set in stone. I'm like, yeah, those would be my three, and then the last two constantly rotate as I hear new ideas from people. Yeah, um, and it's my hope that sort of people's people's five change all the time, you know, because we do change all the time. Oh yeah, and yeah. I recorded. For, for for my Patreon backers, I recorded an episode pretty much as the show started, and honestly, I can't remember what my top five were. My my five were then, and I'm sure if I put the list together now, I, I can remember one of the games because it's the greatest game ever made. So for sure, for sure, that would go. But probably the rest of them would be completely different now. You know. Hey man, what's the greatest game ever made? Well, it's through the ages. Patrons? Oh, through the ages. Not very nice. I love that game. So in in terms of the people listening to Five Games for Doomsday, what's your goal there? What what do you want people to experience and come away with after listening to a given episode? Well, I think what's really important for me is that the people who make these games, uh, when you when you hear them being interviewed, it's always sort of in a quasi marketing situation, right? In the Usually they go on podcasts to talk about what they've got new coming out. And so it's all very focused on that. I want a bigger picture with these people. I want my goal is for the people who listen to my show to come away kind of feeling they know these people better. So when I interviewed Ignacy Trevichek, for instance, you know, we talked a lot about sort of gaming behind the Iron Curtain and how Poland's developed after the wall fell down you know and that's i mean it's kind of about gaming tangentially in that he was operating at that time but it's more about sort of what his childhood was like and what it is you know changing from a communist to a capitalistic system and i all of that stuff super fascinating so i i guess i want a record of who these people are do you find that that the premise breaks through that marketing barrier yeah absolutely because and 
unless there are people who are just super focused on that. And honestly, I haven't had one guest yet that is just like, I'm just going to choose the next five games I've got coming out in the next 12 months and talk about those. Um, people are people are really sporting. People really follow the spirit of the show. And what's wonderful is they're often they're often quite open about their lives. I mean, I had this one guy on. He does a RPG podcast, and he's you know very talented. His podcast is excellent, and we we got into sort of his mental health issues and his his suicide attempt and his views on mental health treatment in America and things like that. And I, yeah, I want to sort of peel back the layers of who a person is as much as possible, basically. Mm -hmm. And have there been any particularly memorable guests for you? I mean, I guess it's the, it's the big people, right? It's the colossi. So, you know, I've interviewed Richard Garfield, which was amazing. Rainer Canizio was like the first sort of bona fide legend I interviewed. And it was, you know, quite difficult to get hold of him. It was sort of 40 emails and a, a long back and forth, but eventually got him on the show. And I was sort of concerned that he might not be too into it. And it ended up being a super show. And he's a really interesting guy. And then just in October, I interviewed Sandy Peterson. And, you know, Sandy Peterson for board gamers might not be a hugely well-known name, but the guy is an absolute legend. He wrote the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. He was the principal designer on the first Doom. And, you know, I mean, this is this is a man who who his legacy in the world of games, his, his shadow falls very, very far. You know? So, I mean, for me, just just a privilege that these people give over their time and then don't ask money for it. Let's move over to talking about, I guess, our main topic for today, the role of the reviewer. So hmm. do you want to start with, because when I put out a call for these podcasts, and there's going to be a number of, of podcasts like these interviews or conversations, as I call it. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like the word interview. I got a huge response on Twitter. Um, I just randomly tweeted, hey, anyone want to be on the podcast? And I got like 30 responses, which I wasn't expecting at all. And well, we're all we're all we're all dying for attention. That's all it is. We're all broken people <laughs> with massive holes in our souls, and we're just craving attention. Yeah, I mean that's that's fine with me. Uh, <laughs> it gets me to people to talk to, which is great. Absolutely. Uh, but but I wanted it, you know, like like you do with your show. I wanted it to be more than just like, hey, here's what I'm working on. So I said, okay, any topic, what do you want to talk about? And, and you suggested the role of the reviewer. And I assume right. it's tied to that podcast we t we talked about earlier, that, that little episode well, it, you, you posted a couple of months ago. Yeah, I guess it was just on my mind at the time. You know? So, I mean, I'm going to ask you, because what do you think, not board game reviewers, what do, what do you think the goal of a reviewer is? What, what is their role within the community? Why do they exist? I mean... Yeah, there's a couple ways you can look at it. Like, why does any individual one reviewer do what they want to do? I don't know. That's up to the person. Some reviewers, it seems, just want to have some way to talk about something they're interested in, which I think is right. perfectly fine. Right. If you if your goal is, like, I like board games, this seems to be the way people talk about board games. I want to, you know, recommend some to, to people, and then they get into it that way. That's fine. For me... And what I think I would like to see in terms of board game criticism or board game reviewing is that I would like to see it as a starting point for deeper conversations about the medium. Hmm. So there's this idea of the critic as like the gatekeeper, which I guess, sure, there's a bit of that, but I don't think that should necessarily be the goal. I see the value of criticism as kind of a an impetus for conversation, an impetus for thought to where you read a piece of criticism. And, and I started really with, with movie criticism. There was a brief moment uh, in college, probably, what would that be, like 10 years ago, where I was like, oh, maybe I'll look into being a movie critic because I'd, I'd been reading a lot of movie criticism. I found it fascinating mm -hmm. and realized, you know, there's there's like, there aren't many movie critics uh, actually being movie critics out there anymore. So I went to something even right. more niche. Uh, board game criticism, but the value to me was that it, it got me thinking about movies differently and whether or not I agreed with them or whether or not I found their interpretation completely on point or completely off base. The point is, is that they 
gave me a language and a way to think about movies that I hadn't had before. And that led to a deeper understanding to where I moved on to the next piece of criticism I read. I had a better understanding, and then I took something from that and moved on and on. And, and my, my thought about movies deepened and developed, and I began to to get my own voice in, in more independent thinking about movies. And so for me, that's the value of it is that yeah. it's just part of a conversation, but hopefully a more authoritative or at least more knowledgeable one or more thought out one that helps the readers or listeners or whatever. Yeah. I, I, think, I, think, I, think, this is, I think it's a two pronged thing. I think it's absolutely what you said, but it also, also, sort of reviewing i guess i guess you can split it into reviewing and criticism right i think reviewing is essentially a buying guide right should i go and see this movie should i buy this book should i watch this tv show should i buy this board game right and i think that's kind of where board game reviewing is at right I, i i think there's very little criticism out there but there's an awful lot of reviewing and I, I think it's, I think it's super interesting because if you if you look at the sort of structure of board game reviewers, and I, I, I have a big issue with it. So I guess you know people who are going into writing film criticism, you know, are coming off the back of Peter Travers or people like this. They read their reviews, and before they find their voice, they try and ape that style. Which, if you read a lot of sort of movie reviews and things, they're good writers first and foremost, right? Then they have a sense of astuteness and criticism and all of this is great. And what you see in board games is people are basing their reviewing style on Tom Vassell, who, with all due respect, is not particularly erudite and has what I think is a fundamentally flawed review structure that doesn't really tell me anything. And so what I see in the nascent form of reviewing in board games is There is no desire for craft and rigor in the way you do things. It's about, I'll explain, I'll do a bad job of explaining the rules, and then I'll do some offhand opinions that I haven't really thought about. And and that's the biggest issue I have with board game reviewing, is that it's fundamentally not very good, because I think it's fundamentally based upon a flawed structure. And I think people should... I think I don't think people, if they're going into reviewing board games, should look at other board game reviewers for their inspiration. I think they should go off to film criticism, book criticism, and you know base their sort of style upon that because these people are well, they're professionals, which most board game reviewers aren't, right? So they have a a need to be rigorous and structured and thoughtful in the actual style of what they do, and yeah. But, you know, it's clear board games are a new thing, and especially the reviewing criticism of them is very new. So it's going to be haphazard. But. Yeah. And, and, you know, I've, I've become similarly disillusioned with, with the Dice Tower reviews, and especially that structure. But, man, on the other hand, you, I sit here and, and think there are certainly a lot of people who get some value out of it, clearly. Across the Dice Tower to is come the... Back. You know, the Dice Tower is the reason I'm here. I, don't get me wrong. I I don't think their reviews are particularly interesting or astute. But they are absolutely indispensable, especially when you're entering the hobby, right? Because they're so exhaustive. And, and for all of their sort of foibles and sort of amateurishness, I think in many ways, they're quite compelling guys and interesting to interesting to listen to and i think they they do a hell of a lot for the community some things are negative but by and large i think part of a large part of the reason that so many people are gamers is is down to the dice tower and i I guess it's kind of nice they're being remunerated now for that yeah yeah I, i agree i think and i thought about this a while that you know, I don't find that review structure very compelling. A lot of people s- certainly come back to it over and over again, and they and they copy and they keep listening to or watching or, or reading it. It's very easy. I mean, if you look at the oh, sort yeah. of um, volume of the Dice Tower stuff, that it's a very easy structure. 
you know, mm-hmm. super easy. Bang out the rules. That's not creative. And then bang out some random thoughts. Neither is that particularly hard work. I'm not saying they don't work hard. They work long. I just don't think they work hard. Yeah, yeah. My theory is, or my hypothesis, I suppose, is that that structure is clearly not coming from, again, art criticism. What it's coming from, I think, is technology reviews, right? So if you go look okay. at a review of a smartphone, it's very similar to that style. It's it's not broken up into rules or whatever, because there aren't. But it's like, okay, now we're going to look at this aspect of the smartphone. Are its specs better than last year's model? How does it compare to other games? What does it have? Like, what does it objectively right. have? How does that compare to other things of its kind? And then we move on to the next aspect, right? And it, and it sounds like a lot of board games reviews I see out there. It's like, okay, this is a worker placement game. How does it compare to other worker placement games? Well, in this game, you can, you know, there's one worker that supersedes the other workers. So that's cool. Instead of just having, you know, once a spot is taken, it's blocked. Now we move on to the art. Well, how is the art of the game? Well, compared to these other games, it's, I like it better, right? It, it, it's that very kind of point by point, just trying to do the basis, like like the most base level analysis of comparison to other games without looking, I think, deeper at the, at the whole of the experience, which is well, where well, actually, I don't art see, I don't see I don't see much of that, actually. I think what I tend to see is, here are the rules of the game. And then this is what I think about the game, which are two things that are completely disconnected, really. Oh, sure. And yeah. also, but, but, but in that and latter also, part, in that here's what I think about the game, I, I often see it, it was like this other game, but it had this difference. It was right. Uh, it had this mechanism and this mechanism, and I thought the art was nice, right? It's just kind of going through a checklist of different disparate aspects of a game. And they're doing right. some kind of basic comparison. And, you know, I, I guess that's interesting because, you know, I don't know what it's like in America, but I can't imagine it's hugely different. In that a lot of the people I think who are into games are an awful lot of computer programmers and people who are into IT. And I, I think it's about systems, people who are into systems and manipulating systems and controlling systems and very orderly thought. And so they're coming towards the reviewing of games from a very orderly sort of quasi-scientific viewpoint, I guess. Whereas if you look at other forms of criticism, they're cre- they're criticizing an art form and don't come at it from a technical viewpoint, more a artistic, philosophical viewpoint, I guess. And who am I to criticize? I mean, I'm hardly making any money and they're making tons, so... You know, it's just I, I I know what I prefer more. Right. Yeah. And I and yeah, I think it is that it is true. Like in America, a lot of the people who are into board games do come from a technical background. There are a lot of computer nerds, science nerds, um, and and it, it makes sense given what board games are. Right. You know, the the barriers to board gaming is largely you know understanding a set of rules which are written out in pseudo programmic language, right? If this, then that, you know, all that. Uh, so people who are drawn to it are going to be drawn to that kind of thinking to begin with. And people who aren't necessarily drawn to that kind of thinking have to overcome these barriers to getting into board games. Yeah, I, th- I think that's my, at least my hypothesis on the root of it, is that that's why mm-hmm. we see those kinds of reviews. That's why they do well. And that's why you see all these calls for objective reviewing, which is... It's an oxymoron, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a complete oxymoron. How can you be objective? I think what people mean is that you should you should put the same criteria onto each game you play and judge it based on that criteria. I think that's what they mean, right? Yeah, maybe. Or or sometimes I th- a lot of the times I see in, in thankfully the call for ob- or the mentioning of objective reviews is not nearly as prevalent here as it is in video games. But right. I think. A lot, a lot of the times it's like, no, this review wasn't objective because it doesn't line up with the other reviews. In which case I'm like, okay, then why are you looking at a single review to begin with? Why aren't you just looking at an aggregator like Medicare right. or something like that? Like if that's what you actually want. I think it's I think it's I think it's crazy. And people who talk about objectivity in reviews they 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 write these essays that make no bloody sense. Because fundamentally 
fundamentally, no matter how high-minded you are about your criticism, what it is is about having an opinion and then retrofitting a logic onto that opinion. That's what reviewing is. I like this game. Okay, why? Mm-hmm. It's not, oh, I see these aspects, therefore I like this game. That's that's not what it is. It is it is having an instinctive reaction and then working out why that reaction was the way it was. And so this is not objective. This is purely subjective. And I think the, the value in a regular reviewer is knowing where you and that reviewer come together and where you diverge, right? And going, okay, I understand they said this about this. That probably reflects my view here and not my review there. Not my view there, right? Yeah, precisely. Although although I would contest with the idea that it's purely subjective because I think there's a very interesting, particularly in, well, I, in, in, all, in all criticism, right? There, there's an interesting aspect of, yes, it's subjective, right? It, it filters through my mind, which imparts subjectivity to it to some degree. But part of the fun of of writing a review to me is then looking at the game itself, looking at the objective aspects of the game. Okay, what about the game caused that to happen in me? Um, So there is some level of objective analysis about, okay, let's look at the game as a thing. But what what do you mean by objective? What, What do you mean by objective there? I mean, ignoring the meta-analysis of whether anything can be objective. <laughs> right. So, so sort of <laughs> having a sort of ad hoc quasi objectiveness that we all kind of agree is what we're going to use for objectivity. Sure. Agreeing that things exist. Um, right. <laughs> objective means that we're talking about the object, not the subject. Right. So, if if we're talking about something, if we're talking about a board game objectively. We, What I mean by that is looking at the aspects of the game that exist separate from the participants. So, right. So I may have a particular reaction to a game, but that, that reaction is formed by this, this mess, this, this heap of the context at the time, the people I'm playing with, but also the particular rules of the game that happened to be triggered at that point in time. And, Perhaps, you know, the presentation of the game at that particular point in time filtered, you know, again, all filtered through my mind, but there are objective, there are aspects of the game that exist separate from myself that were part of the causality of my experience. And trying to pinpoint and pick out those aspects of the game I find very rewarding in saying, okay... Sure, a lot of it was that I was having, you know, I was I had a couple of beers in me, and there, were, you know, I was with some good friends. But there was a particular point caused by the game itself that that made the experience fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's interesting. I, I think reviewers, I, I think when you're doing that sort of stuff, you should work to your strength. So I am very much a a sort of arty, farty, not so technical type. And so when I when I talk about the qualities of a game, I often talk about the effect it has on me and what it does to my brain, essentially, how warm it makes me feel, how much I smile, because that's how I convey what this piece of cardboard and wood and plastic becomes greater than itself, I guess. But I, I, I think also... I think also saying there are these technical aspects that lead to this is an absolutely right way to go about it. I would quibble that it's objective in any way. Sure, we can quibble about the language of it, but we agree on the principle, I think. Yeah. And, and I think that's just a matter of us approaching it from a different angle, but approaching the same kind of idea of what we want to review to be. So, like, you know, going back to what you said, the greatest game of all time is through the ages, right? I can... When well, I that's an objective that, fact, though. Sure, yeah. We, I mean, let's take it as whether we agree or <laughs> whether we agree or disagree on that is absolutely beside the point because <laughs> there is, there is one truth in this universe, and that's that through the ages is the greatest board game ever made, at least top ten. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, so one of the most remarkable things about through the ages for me is just how quickly time progresses in the game, and mm-hmm. so. 
you know, we can look at that from kind of the experiential, emotional aspect of the game that time just keeps slipping away from you and you try to you try to achieve these things that you just can't or by the time you are able to achieve them, they're no longer valuable. And I think that's a right. wonderful aspect of the game. And then you can approach it from the more technical, what I would call objective angle of how that aspect of the game forces you into really tight decision making where you have to make super difficult uh, decisions about opportunity cost in relation not just to resources but to, but to time that analysis is, is is looking at the same thing from two different angles but i think it's both both angles are, are really interesting and valuable and can help you understand games better and i i think what really and also there's kind of a third which is a sort of auteurist sort of author the voice of the author viewpoint which which i really love in through the ages in that you know, he's very he's very down on religion. He's very down on communism. He's sort of quite up on the sort of free market. And the way he he doesn't portray that through text on cards, he portrays that through mechanical ramifications mm -hmm. that happen in the game. And that's super interesting. Oh, the yeah. idea that, that you can have this auteuric vision and do it not in the conventional narrative way, but through game mechanics, something that is intrinsically about games and not just an aping of literature or film. Oh, for sure. In, in now we're really getting off topic, but this is something that's been on my mind for a while that I think civilization games in particular have this challenge that of, of how do you value something on a civilization level, right? And so each game has right. its own little individual perspective on what is value on this really fundamental level and they usually call it something like culture or advancement or progress or something yeah. like that but what creates culture and then furthermore why is that why are those things valuable and what are they more valuable than is is often incredibly fascinating in ter just in that specific genre of game what I don't see more of, and I think there's only one kind of game that does it, there's only one designer who's doing it, and that's Phil Eklund, is what I don't see is future civilization games. Because, you know, essentially civilization games are aspirational. What the, what the players and the designers are doing is asking you to create as close to utopia as you can. And I was talking to Phil Eklund about sort of civilization games and his game that goes on into the future. And I said, you know, is it aspirational for you? And he said, absolutely, it's aspirational. I'm designing a game that hopefully results in the players creating something close to what I think is a perfect world. And I think that's fine. And I think you can do that without limiting the player's ambition either, right? Or, of course, you can show them the opposite. You can point them in the direction of creating dystopia in order to highlight what utopia is. Yeah, precisely. And, and while I haven't, I've, I've only played, I think, one Phil Eklund game. From what I understand, his worldview, for, back of, for lack of a better term, is super individualist. Um, which well, I find, go ahead. Phil is a very nice guy, and, you know, I think there's a lot of people, because he does come across as sort of super individualist, but in dealing with him, I find him to be very, very nice and also very, very contradictory in what he believes. And, and this, is the problem with, this is the problem with libertarianism, in that it fundamentally can't work because that's not the kind of animal that we are. We can't survive alone. We are genetically predisposed to form cohesive communities. And, you know, this is this is a guy who's living in Germany, who is enjoying the fruits of a very social democratic center left society. So for all of his protestations and all of his, you know, aspirations, I don't think he really is when it boils down to it. It's just he likes to talk about it. And that's fine, because we all like to talk out of our rear ends at times. right? <laughs> One thing that, again, going off on this tangent of civilization games, I don't know if it exists. I think there's there's something that that's unexplored in terms of valuating values, right? Values in civilization or society, and that is games right. that let you that let you as a player determine what is valuable, rather than the designer of the game just saying, "Okay, these things contribute to culture," right? Yeah, I mean, on an individual level, Fog of Love does that, right? But I, I, I don't know if there's anything out there that does it on on a societal or civilizational level. 
But I think that I'm trying to think of anything that I mean through the ages to an extent allows you to go in different directions to focus on religion to focus on military to to use those things but i think i think vlada chavatl is very very clear on what he thinks about those different aspects of society you can win using them but i don't think he's particularly gracious to things like religion and the military so any game that allows you to paint your own political map i guess hasn't been made yet and would be super interesting yeah yeah but obviously very difficult to pull off I think. Well, this is why I'm not a game designer. That's not my job to have those ideas. <laughs> All right. Retreating back from, from Civilization Games as a whole, back to games reviewers. So we talked about kind of the approaches that we have and, and the things we like to see. Are, are there any reviewers out there that you particularly enjoy that you that you look to and say, okay, they're, yeah, they're doing something that I find interesting? Yeah, and it's someone who our tastes are almost diametrically opposed, actually. But I think the the reason I like him as a reviewer is because he's just such a really good writer and he knows how to structure a nice, tight review. And he cares about the quality of his sentence, his sentences. And that's uh, Matt Thrower. And I think his Twitter is at M A T T H R. And yeah, he writes super tight little sort of 500 word reviews on games. And they're really compelling and they're really fun and they're really nice pieces of writing in and of themselves. And, you know, I. I first read one of his reviews, which was a game I just reviewed that I detested, and he absolutely adored. And I read his review, and I loved his review, and I completely disagreed with it. And I think, I think that's kind of important that you should you should come to the end of a review thinking that was enjoyable in and of itself, regardless of the information I've just gleaned. Mm-hmm. What game was that, by the way? It was Wildlands. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Which I, I I did not get along with. <laughs> I haven't. I I looked at it once and I was like, "Eh, do I have time to demo that game?" And it, it seemed like a handful. I, I do I do like Matt's writing as well quite a bit. I, I haven't actually read one of his reviews in a couple of months. Is he still doing the first person kind of narrative approach? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Where he which is which is super super fun. Yeah, and it's something I don't see. I I've I don't know if I've seen. Well, I, I've seen it a bit in video games writing, but but certainly not in board games writing, where he goes through just the ex, like very specifically the experiences he's had playing the game and, and intersperses, I guess what you could call bits of criticism yeah. within that it, story. It absolutely does its job, though. It conveys oh, yeah. whether he thinks the game is good and what it what it is about the game he thinks that is good. It does it does absolutely its role as a informative piece of writing well but also at the same time as an entertaining piece of writing Mm -hmm. because they should be i think that style lets him more easily communicate subtle differences of opinion or or or, because it's taken from this idea okay i've played the game a a few times and i'm looking back upon those experiences and so it's really good at capturing the feeling of wow i enjoyed that at the time but i don't really want to play this i I don't really look forward to playing it the next time or you know maybe i i found it puzzling but i'm i'm it's it's lingered in my mind since those subtleties i think are are more easily captured with that style well and also also what tom vassal does what matt thrower does and why i wrote that piece is because I see a very worrying trend in board game reviewing. My my the piece that I wrote wasn't a reaction actually to sort of stylistic uh, how bad reviewers are because I don't I don't think you know there's loads of people who aren't you know Space Biff again is another guy who's a really good writer. Oh, he's great. But sort of my issue is there is a really worrying trend, I think, and it's not of paid reviews because that's crazy because why would board games companies pay people to review games? Because, you know, people will will write university positive things for the price of a free game. It's, it's my worry that because it's an amateurish thing, 
in a very close industry. It might, yeah, I'll, I'll go back to it. I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm rambling here. But basically, people were arguing on Twitter that a board game reviewer has no obligation to write negative reviews, right? And that they needn't do it. And my point was, is that, well, yes, you should. If you play the game and you don't like it, well, you should then talk about that because your obligation is not to the publisher. Fundamentally, it never is to the publisher. If you're publishing reviews of games, your obligation is to the people who read those reviews. There should be an understanding that publishers give games to reviewers for review consideration with the understanding that it's possible that you might write bad things about it. And You know, you see a lot of reviewers who are universally positive, and I find that deeply, deeply suspect because you can't like everything, right? Yeah, yeah, and that that worries me quite a bit, also, because it's yeah, it's just not valuing the reader at all, and at that point, it's like, why are you doing this? And well, why they're doing it is for free games and relationships with publishers, and I think that is it's understandable. I get free games to review, and it's super cool. I love getting free games. I'm not going to deny it. But if the game's crap, I have a fundamental obligation to the people who listen to my reviews to say that I think the game is crap. And if that means the publisher won't send me free games anymore, well, I don't get free games from that publisher. I, I guess it's it's just the pursuit of, of free games. But man, like... I turn down a lot of games that I get offered because they just look like the worst time on earth. Right. And and if if your goal is just to accumulate as many games as possible, you're going to be playing a bunch of awful games, even if you never write about them. For and sure. I, I don't I don't see how that's desirable, but that's beside the point. I, I think I think your point that it's it's super worrying about people producing universally positive reviews, and and I think it's it's worth pointing out that the two big reviewers in our industry so the dice tower and shut up and sit down are not like that they will they're absolutely not like that yeah they will definitely publish negative reviews which which is great tom vassal always did and i think what's really interesting is because tom vassal was coming in at the sort of beginning of the major explosion of sort of youtube reviewing and things and that was just the custom then you just were honest and no one thought anything about it yeah, the fact the fact that it's developed into a place where people are defending dishonesty, and I think withholding negative views on things is essentially dishonesty. I think is is a very worrying trend. People should people should take themselves seriously and be honest. And and you know what what blows my mind is is that oh I don't like writing negative reviews. Why not? It's hugely fun. <laughs> working out why you don't like something is is the same process as working out why you do like something. It's exactly the same thing you're doing. I find the ones in the middle are the most difficult. You're just like, yeah, it's fine. That's the hardest to write about. Absolutely. I I think it's partially that they want free games. It's partially that maybe they just don't like writing negative reviews. But also I think it's this idea that, well, for every game there's an audience, right? There's going to be someone who likes that game. So I should try to find that audience and and tell them why they'll like that game which i think is like that's just like the erasing of of your own self in your writing right this is why i think this notion of objectivity is pointless and and fundamentally i don't want to use the word dangerous because that's massively over dramatic but you know it's seeking objectivity is pointless trusting your subjective view of something that's what you should go for i think right and and it's it's at the same time kind of empowering of yourself, but also it's it's a humble position, right? Because the reviewer, when they're explaining their subjective experience, shouldn't, at least in my perspective, should not be saying this is the end of the conversation about this game. Right. For me, that's the beginning of the conversation, right? When if 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 you and I have a different experience about a game and we're able to articulate why that experience happened and in what aspects of the game caused that, that's the beginning of a wonderful conversation. Absolutely. I, I think broadly in culture, there's this idea that the critic is trying to say, no, I am correct the end, which I don't, if you talk to any critic, I don't think they're going to say that's true of them at all. No, but also 
this sounds really terrible, but I, I, I think because the internet is so fractious and vicious, I think people have put a lot of stock in being nice. And nice is fine when you're sat around a table chatting with people. But when you're being, you know, critical of something, and that is your role, don't be nice, be honest. Mm -hmm. The the minute you put something out into the public domain for people to consume, you have to understand that people may have very, very good reasons for disliking it and understand that. And I don't, and, uh, you know, board gaming is such a small community as well i understand i I had to write a review for a friend of mine's game a couple of months ago and i hated it and i had to explain why i hated my friend's game and it's not easy and christ i'm not mother Teresa, but you know i i did it i just because it's unconscionable to be dishonest in that way you have to be honest and take the potential ramifications of it otherwise why the hell are you in the business yeah and i think in, in internet discourse there's also this this assumption that you have to constantly overcome that if if you say you dislike something you're not necessarily saying that everyone who likes that thing is wrong and awful no absolutely not i mean even like for example i think the movie maybe my least favorite movie ever made is american beauty i think it's not only a poorly made movie, but I think it's it's morally evil. I think it's just awful. I mean, I think you're absolutely insane, but... But I would listen... I, I'm not saying the people to like the movie are morally evil people. I think... I mean, I, I, can't understand, I can't understand that you could say American Beauty is your least favorite movie when The Craft exists, but there we are. <laughs> I mean, there's certainly worse movies on a on a technical level, but... I yeah, I was just disgusted by it. But again, that's the beginning of a conversation. I'm not saying that people who enjoy that movie are awful people. Maybe I just had a, such a horrible gut reaction to the movie that I'm overreacting. But again, it's the beginning of the conversation. It's not the end of the conversation. Right. And, you know, I think the problem is when people are having nuanced arguments in 280 characters or fewer they're not going to be particularly nuanced arguments and they're going to be deploying exclamation marks, right? And so we've become, so we, there are a certain group of people who've become very, very conflict averse and they think that saying something negative about something is being, is instigating conflict. Well, it needn't. It can instigate debate, which is interesting. Right. Yeah. It, it, although I, I completely sympathize with the people, especially if they're active on the internet, with being conflict averse, because there's also a lot of people who seek out conflict in very extreme statements, and they only speak in absolutist terms and stuff like that. Absolutely. You see it all the time, and that's what gets popular on the internet. Um, so the yeah, reaction well, well, is completely understandable. Well, when it comes to this point. Don't seek your validation from hearts on Twitter. Just don't bloody do it. And if you find yourself doing it, pull back, stop using Twitter, because that way you will become a unnuanced, extreme version of yourself and you'll end up miserable. I mean, the, the thing about when, I mean, barely anyone bloody listens to my podcast, but if I release a review that is positive and you mostly don't get arguments against positive stuff. You mostly get arguments against negative stuff. The beauty about releasing it into the open is that I've already made my point. If people want to come back at me, that's fine, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue with them because I have a solid recorded as permanent as permanent is version of my view of this If we ended up sitting around a table and wanted to have a chat about it in real life, then, yeah, I would. But my review's there. Mm -hmm. Have an argument. Shout at at your Bluetooth speaker. Don't shout at me. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you about your particular style of reviewing because we talked about mat throwers. I mentioned kind of mine of looking at the... I, I tend to focus more on finding those mechanical bits of the game that cause the experience. Mm. I've noticed, at least in your reviewers or your reviews on uh, Five Games for Doomsday, that 
correct me if this is completely off base, but I, they seem to be very thesis driven reviews where you, yeah. you, you tend to open with a statement or an argument about usually something outside of the world of board games. And then you like to relate your experience of that game to that thesis uh, throughout the review. Is that something that you're consciously trying to do? Or is that like the natural way you tend to write? Um, I teach a course on writing argumentative essays at university, mm-hmm. at a university. And I focus a lot on how important the thesis is and how everything relates to the central thesis. If you're making an argument, you have a central thesis and everything you write has to relate to that central thesis. And it's a concept that people kind of find difficult to grasp at first. But I guess it, it happens to me when I'm playing the game. I'll, I'll, I'll play the game and I think something will occur to me and I'll go, ah, I see. That's the sort of crux of what this game is. That's where the interest lies. There's a, a central idea. And then what I do, and it might just be a bit of self-indulgence. And no, no, it, it's the thing. It definitely is a bit of self-indulgence. But what, what I then like to do is sort of explore that concept first as a sort of general idea. So I wrote a review about a game that was clearly hadn't been play tested. It was much, much too long. Its conception was quite good, but its execution was awful. And I think the review was basically about this notion of having too much faith in your initial ideas and not working not having an idea and then working on that idea to make it better. So what I do in the beginning part of the review is explain that concept. So then when I relate it to a board game, you've already sort of, you know what you know where I'm coming from and you can see how it applies to this central idea of something that's good or bad about this game, you know. Mm-hmm. And so it might it might be something about a mechanic that doesn't work, but it might just be, I wrote a review about Spirion, and actually, I mean, I really love the game. I think the game's really good, but essentially, it was a review about nostalgia, and it was a review about my first Essen. I, on a whim, bought a copy of Spirion on the Saturday, leaving the convention, played it that night, and it was part. a large part of loving that game is that night at Essen when I was just new into the hobby and I was playing with these strangers and they were all super welcoming and really nice and how valuable an experience that was. And so that was my in to sort of exploring that game. Yeah, and I guess it is thesis driven. I have a central idea. I explain what that central idea means and then how it relates to the game. Mm -hmm. Do Do you find that limiting at all? Well, it's it's about structure, isn't it? And it's it's sort of a structure that I stumbled on. It wasn't it wasn't ever deliberate. No, I think structure is incredibly liberating. What structure allows you to do is it's the tyranny of the blank page, right? Mm-hmm. If you have absolutely no idea what you're going to do, then it makes it difficult. And I, you know, I do at least one review a week, and writing, you know, I'm not a professional writer, so writing fifteen hundred words on something a week is hard work. If I have this structure, this sort of basic idea of how the review is going to go, it really helps with starting, finishing, and redrafting. It, it, it's it, yeah, structure is incredibly liberating. It's absolutely the opposite of limiting. It's it sounds so appealing to me, but my my thought processes always when I'm writing always tend to be. Well, I mean, just like this podcast, right? I tend to enjoy going off topic and rambling about in, in finding something that's interesting and poking at it or looking at a topic and in, in, in surrounding it and looking at it from different angles that my, my writing process tends to be just like spewing out as much as I can on, onto the paper and then trying to structure something from that rather than looking at structure forward. So well, well, I, that's, I find that's it. Your, yeah. That's your structure though, right? I mean, there's no right way to do anything. Oh, sure. Yeah. I have a sort of, I have a sort of idea. I have an idea of how to do something. You do too. And they may be different. And I may look at your process and go, bloody hell, how do you get anything out of that? And there's, there's no reason to say you can't go off on tangents. I mean, this last review I published, a large part of the opening sort of five minutes was me talking about, well, the review was five minutes long. So the opening two minutes was me talking about how when God was giving out skills, I was stuck in the corner trying to eat chewable 
aspirin for kids and so I'm useless at everything, you know. And it's, yeah, it's, it's however, it's getting to the destination. However you get there, whether it's in a VW Beetle or a Lamborghini is absolutely by the by. It's fine. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's fun to, to find different ways and, and look at different ways people arrive at that point, I think. I saw an interview with a with a writer. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been David Mitchell, and they were talking about when they when they do talks. He knows who the aspiring writers are because the aspiring writers are the people who ask him what is his writing process, what's his daily routine, <laughs> because they're thinking I don't know what my writing process is, what my daily routine is. This is a great best selling author. Maybe they'll give me some impetus or some inspiration to how i can focus my time to write what it is is you 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 do it enough and now i I've, I've written probably this podcast has been going this podcast has been going for nearly two years i've probably written 80 90 reviews now and you know your writing process kind of becomes solidified through practice I, yeah I, i've certainly discovered that as well Going back to reviewing, is there anything else you, you wanted to mention in terms of reviewing in board games that we haven't yet talked about? I just want, and I think it's going away. Well, there's two things. One, I want people to look at the content. So I think it's understandable in board games. You get a lot of stuff that looks amazing. Technically, it's brilliant because you have people who are really technically astute and they know how to focus a camera, they know how to do effects, they know how to do Photoshop, all of this. And yet when they start speaking, it's completely unengaging because they haven't thought about the bloody content. And frankly, the content is the most important thing. It's great if it looks good and sounds great, but it is the content that people are there for fundamentally. So what I, what I would like more of in board game media in general is more rigor and more craft and more thought about what you're saying, how you're saying it. And then, you know, then look at your aspect ratios and your lavalier mics, you know. I'm still baffled by the disparity in, I guess, reception between video and written. Like I, I right. went in, like it, it seems that written reviews are the are the lowest barrier to entry, but by far video is is much much more popular, which which is confusing to me. But it's also you know it's a selfish complaint because I do write I do write my reviews. Um, well, it's, a, it's a thing, right? I, I don't think anyone. If you look at the home of reviews, where are the home of reviews? In newspapers, essentially. Mm -hmm. And so reviews are kind of things that you stumble on whilst flicking through the newspaper, and you go, oh, that movie, that's interesting. Reviews are side dishes, essentially. And so you don't sort of go into it. You don't buy a newspaper for the review section. You buy a newspaper for the news. And so written reviews have always been that. It's just that newspapers have seen the value of them. Mm -hmm. When you're doing written stuff independently, it's kind of hard oh, to yeah. get people to, to read it because, you know, video is just more... It's more arresting and it's less it's less active a pursuit. You can veg out in front of a video. It's very difficult to veg out in some in front of something you're reading, right? Yeah, yeah, that's true. I guess I shouldn't assume necessarily that that writing is the lower barrier or the lower cost, I suppose. But it's precisely why I do enjoy writing and, and I prefer both in, in reading reviews and, and creating them I enjoy writing just because of the ability to look back on something that you read before right it's much harder to do that if right. you're like wow did i hear that correctly you got to fiddle with youtube and, and find the right spot with writing you can kind of scan across the page which i which i think is is such a valuable aspect of that medium and i have a friend who has an incredible vocabulary and, and knows lots of arcane words and so when i'm writing a review sometimes he'll just send me a message saying put this word in your review <laughs> and i have no idea what the word means so i'll have to go and see what the word means and then find a way to artfully weave it into my writing all of that stuff's amazing fun you know oh yeah yeah 
Anyway, so hopefully we have provided some kind of insight for those listening for what we would like to see in reviews and maybe some inspiration for you all, what you all want to try to find and pursue in board game reviewing and board game criticism. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check out five games for Doomsday. Is there anything else I should guide them towards for your, I hate this word, content? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> just go to five games for doomsday.com i mean the website's awful but there's everything is there everything's there you will everything's there all the reviews all the interviews you'll be able to find someone you like and go oh that's interesting and fingers crossed it will be yes yes i, I can vouch it's extremely interesting so thoughtfulgamer.com five games for doomsday.com if you would like you have a patreon as well right I do, but let's let's have let's not run before we can walk. Let's have them listen to the show before they decide they want to give us some money. Yeah. Well, just in case, remember that Ben has a Patreon for Five Games for Doomsday. I have a Patreon for The Thoughtful Gamer at patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. Don't forget to rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. You can find me on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Ben, you're on Twitter. I know that. Yeah, Twitter at five, the number, games for the number doomsday and yeah there's a facebook page there's an instagram account i can't remember what the handles are for those and i'm a man of the world so if you bump into me on the street then take me for a pint there you go open invitation thanks for listening everybody goodbye